to Textiles and Tea with the Hand Weavers Guild of America. I'm Kathy Group. I'm the Advertising and Marketing Manager, and I'll be your host today. Today, we are sponsored by Weave a Real Peace. If you don't know much about this organization, I encourage you to go to their website. They do wonderful things of supporting other countries and the women and men who work in the fiber industry. Go check them out. Today, uh, we will take questions the last 15 minutes, like we always do. Please put your questions in the uh, chat, not in the chat, but put them in the q and I can't see them if they're in the chat. We love your comments, though. Keep those coming. Uh, today, we have Myra Wood. Myra is an internationally known fiber artist, designer, author, teacher. And if you think you don't know who Myra Wood is, you just don't realize that her work and her books and her videos are everywhere. She teaches a wide range of classes in knitting, crochet, embroidery, beading, specializing in all things creative. Myra is the author of Crazy Shot and Crazy Shot Companion, Knit in New Directions, Creative Crochet Lace, Crazy Lace, along with numerous publication patterns in books and magazines. Myra has been a guest instructor on numerous episodes of Knit and Crochet Now, Nitty Gritty, Uncommon Threads, Knitting Daily on PBS, HGTV, and DIY Network, and so much more. And she'll talk more about that today. Hi, Myra. Hi, how are you, Kathy? I am good. How are you? Very good. Great. It's good to have you here. Oh, I really appreciate it and want to thank you guys and Weave a Real Peace. Really appreciate them too. They're pretty awesome. Wonderful organization. What is your favorite tea? Mm. Without a doubt, good earth, sweet and spicy. <laughs> I like the sound it's of that. It's like the only tea I drink and I drink it uh, cold, hot, you name it, but it's really, really, it's like sort of a orange gingery kind of thing but it's really spicy and you can mm. smell it across the room so. oh nice nice so how did you get started in fiber well um i think i you know i don't remember not doing fiber it was kind of the thing that i started doing as a craft very long ago my mother taught me how to sew when i was really young and we sewed barbie clothes and then i got into um sewing i i did all kinds of sewing patterns and took lessons at the singer sewing center in the 70s and um did a lot of sewing and then also learned how to crochet didn't learn how to knit until I was probably in college and uh, but had always done that kind of stuff like you know it was the thing I loved the most was like making stuff. Mm -hmm. 
you're you're an artist of many modalities, like you, you were just talking about. Um, I have an idea of you as an art craft explorer, you know, I like Dora the Explorer, that you find a technique or an art form and then you pursue it, you study it, you experiment it until you feel like you're done. And then you go find the next art form. Is is this true? And this image here just shows all the beautiful different work that you do. Wow, you totally get me. And <laughs> yeah, absolutely. I love that. A, what did you call me an explorer? Um, yeah, no, I think that that's a really good way to describe it because I'm not, I'm, I'm not um, drawn to any one specific thing only. I'm drawn to everything. It's like any kind of needle craft, anything that has to do with string, sticks, you name it. I'll try it. And usually what happens is I get obsessed and it becomes my passion for, I don't know, two to five years. And then I basically absorb myself into it as much as I can, learning as much as I can about it, trying as many different things as I can until like something shiny sparkles over here and I turn and like, that's it for that one. So squirrel, squirrel. Well, it, it's nice squirrels. It's amazing. Everything Thank from jewelry you. to crochet. It's wonderful. I also read somewhere that you stated that color is the most essential. And you, you can see that in the work the, of the images we just showed. Can you share more about, about that? And these works, oh, these are gorgeous. Thank you. Um, color is my driving force. It's everything to me. It, you know, it begins the projects, it's the projects the whole way through. For me, the idea is that there are ways to express myself with color, that color and pattern too, but color especially. And it's just one of those things of like the different, I, my eye is always drawn to combinations of colors. I love seeing, you know, it's like, do I have a favorite color at any given time? All of them. So, um, but it really the thing that always amazes me is, you know, different color combinations, unexpected color combinations, things that I love what the hand dyers do with variegated yarns, things like that. It just, it just seems to be the driving force. And a lot of times I will see some yarn or something or a piece of fabric and just be like, okay, that's the palette. That's it. Now I'm going to go make something. <laughs> well, I, I've always asked people this because I'm fascinated by the answer. Do you think you were like born with this amazing color sense? Do you think it developed because you were involved with, with fiber at such a young age or? That's interesting. I don't know. Um, I can tell you that I've been drawn to color and color has kind of caught my eye as far back as I can remember. I mean, I remember the colors that were in my room in my crib. It was peaches and periwinkle. And one of the, um, one of my favorite things when I was really little was memorizing all the names of the crayons. Like I wanted to know not only what colors they were, but what was the name, like sea green. Oh, I love that sea green. So I, it, it, like color has always been something that I, not only am I drawn to it, and I don't know if a person is born with it, but it certainly caught my attention at a very early age. And like, I just love it. I love color. Well, do you, have you done a lot of studying of color? I mean, almost all of us have taken color theory classes. Have you done that often? Or did well, you do the infamous color gants and that sort of thing? Yeah, and I went to art school and we had to study Joseph Albers and all that stuff. And none of that made sense to me. Like all of the things about, you know, I get all of the color theory stuff. And I think that uh, in weaving, there's a lot of important things to understand about um, how colors work together. But for me, it really is about, there's something about creating a palette that I find really pleasing and that just speaks to me. And I think, you know, it's like, a, 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 I've definitely heard people say, I don't know how to mix colors or I don't know how to pick colors and all that. It's like you do, you get dressed every day. You, you put your clothes on, you know what you like to wear. Even if it's neutrals, whatever it is, your eye is drawn to certain things that you love. And then it's just a matter of, I mean, to me, it's just a matter of, 
using those colors you love and maybe adding another color in with it or expressing yourself through monotones or, you know, like there's all different ways to explore color uh -huh. and color is, it's a, you know, one of the things that I do love though, is there's a language of colors. There's like, you know, meanings of colors. I love all that stuff. Cause I think that there, you know, color speaks to me. Uh -huh. I, I can't say that I am a big adherent to any kind of color theory. I just, there are, you know, it's like you walk outside and you look at the colors and, you know, one of the things that influenced me for many years was we lived in Southern California and probably this week, June 6th, June 7th, it's jacaranda season. And jacaranda season is when the trees and jacarandas happen in Southern California, they happen in Australia. Um, Jacarandas are these magnificent trees that canopy streets all year long, except for two or three weeks of the year when they go bright purple and it rains purple petals. Oh, fun. And purple and green is like, yeah, so much of my work has purple and green in it to the point that my husband will look at me working on something and go, oh, purple and green, imagine that. So, but I, you know, I find that the colors that are around me at any given time influence me. Somebody told me something funny that I am aware of very much is that a lot of times what we wear influences the colors we pick when we're shopping for yarn. So really, it, yes, absolutely. And I have noticed myself doing it. I don't know how many times is that if I walk into a store or I walk into a booth that's got like all the different colors and I happen to be wearing turquoises, I gravitate towards the turquoises or I'm wearing like purples or something or reds. It's like somehow I end up coordinating with whatever I'm wearing. So, you know, and so I like to wear lots of different colors so that I get lots of different colors of yarn. Well, now I'm going to have to watch that at Convergence now. I'm going to have to watch people as they go into the booths and see. Yes, that, That's a whole new theory there. That's that's interesting. I caught myself doing it. And it's funny because I don't remember who or when it was, but it was kind of like, is that true? And then I'd always be shopping for something or looking at yarns. And then I'd realize, oh, my God, they match what I'm wearing. Well, I have said that to people. Oh, well, look, your yarn matches what you're wearing. But I never thought it was, you know, more extensive. I have to watch that. That's interesting. Yeah. yeah. Well, we mentioned earlier that you, you like to explore a lot of different art forms. And I want to kind of go back to that is that, do you find that you build from one art form on to another? Can you oh, give yeah. an example of that? I, I, that's a great question. Um, absolutely. I think that one of the things that has really evolved my work over the years is learning new crafts. And I sort of look at it like every type of work that I do influences all the other work that I do. So, you know, um, I did Irish crochet for a long time and learned everything I could about, you know, different kinds of motifs from all over the world. Then I incorporated stuff that I had been doing before in lace crochet into the Irish crochet, found out about modern Irish crochet, which is out of Ukraine, which is amazing. And it all, you know, and some motifs that I have used before or even techniques that I have used before carry on to the whatever I'm working on. Um, my main influence was my sewing back in the day because mm -hmm. I am not a pattern person in that I will sit down and follow a pattern. I do something called template based for pretty much everything that I do. And the idea of template based is if you have a muslin pattern that fits you and that you use, what you're doing, regardless of how you do it, is I'm creating fabric that fits that muslin. So the muslin I know is to my size. Um, it is, I know it's going to fit me. I know that the um, proportions are what I want. Then regardless of what I'm doing, whether I'm knitting, I'm crocheting, I'm weaving, a lot of times I combine all of them. They fit into the template to create a fabric. And once that fabric is made, I sew it together like I normally would construct anything. So, but all of the different stuff that I do absolutely contributes to the whole picture. It's like, there's, there's not a time when I'm only weaving and doing weaving. You know, a lot of the stuff that I did 
um, exploring crazy shot is really from my knitting. And, you know, and, and the idea was that I just, I thought about it and realized there's so many things that I do that cross over to other things. And so I kind of like to think of it as like, the more you learn about different techniques and styles and all that stuff, it fills up your toolbox. You have a better vocabulary, you have a better toolbox to, to play with. Mm -hmm. And I really think of it as playing. Like to me, it's all playing and it's like, oh my gosh, I have new tools. So any, you know, like I am, I, I, it's what you said before, I'm exploring all the time and I go do deep dives. I do serious deep dives, but then I'm always bringing the stuff that I learned before and like going, well, what if I use patterns that I had in embroidery or what if I did, you know, like I, I mix it all together and then it comes out with whatever it is. Yeah, you look like in this photograph, it looks like you've got all kinds of crafts going here, you know, and the, the colors all look the same, no matter what you, you're using to make them. But so what, so the idea is, and I am a, you know, in terms of color, you asked me about color theory. One of the things that I like to do that I think is really important, regardless of what kind of project I'm going to do, is to put all of my fibers together and sit with them for a while like maybe two weeks and like pass, you know, that big bamboo platter that I have, I use a lot where I'll put the yarns out that I'm thinking I want to work with. And then I go into my stash and I find a few more and I put them with them and I see if I like it. And then the stuff that I don't like, I take out. But even before I start a project, I am creating sort of a, an overall palette of things that then I can just, it's sort of like a painting palette where it's all there. And mm -hmm. then I, I have a really good idea of the direction it's going to go in, in terms of the palette. I don't have to think about, well, does this go with this color? Like that is a very primary part of every process that I do is it's about the color. Well, I'm going to have to try that. I don't yeah. think I, I really sit with color when I'm trying to decide. That's a great idea. Well, especially too, a lot of my work is really multicolor. So, you know, especially with multicolor stuff, it's like you can't really get the kind of result you want just willy nilly picking colors and not even, you know, it's like it's going to look like that. It's going to look like a jumble. But if you, I mean, there are people that work with color theory and do things like, you know, whatever they're creating their palette out of. Mm -hmm. If you sit with it for a while and you look at like the colors that you can introduce and maybe some colors are just a teeny accent, but would really like spark the other colors. And, you know, there's just a lot you can do by sitting with it and letting it sort of you know, develop a little bit before you actually just jump right into it. Um, the other thing is, and this is this is one of my favorite hints is a lot of times people say to me that they don't know how to pick colors, like they don't know how to combine colors or pick colors. <laughs> it's really easy. So here's how you do it. There's two basic ways. One is go find your favorite piece of print clothing. Now, go in your closet with your stash and match all the yarns you have to those colors. You just made a palette. Huh. So you can either use a piece of fabric that you love all the colors in the fabric, um, variegated yarns. Variegated yarns are amazing. Um, the, the people that do the dyeing of variegated yarns really understand like what colors are going to work with what. And a lot of times you take one variegated yarn, you go to your closet and you pick out all of those solid colors and then the secondary colors that'll work with it. And like you can, you can make an entire palette from something, you know, that you have sitting around. Um, one of my most, most favorite colorists is Mr. Noro. Um, Noro Colors and Noro Yarn is remarkable stuff because he uses such unexpected colors together. You know, you're working with gray and he's got some blues working in and then all of a sudden there's this shock of persimmon and it's like, why? But it works. And so, you know, sometimes I'll look at um, Noro colors. A lot of times, you know, I confess I'm a purple turquoise um, green person. Uh, it, left to my own devices, I gravitate over there, but I do a lot of stuff in lots of different colors. And a lot of times what I'll do is I'll start with either a print or, you know, a piece of fabric or 
or even Noro yarns, get all those colors together and like create the palette and see what I'm looking at. Well, I have another question about color. When you ship or, or when you would start with a new craft, was there a learning curve for color? Because I know that knitting doesn't give you the same outcome, even with the same colors, as opposed to weaving. You know, the colors do different things when you're doing different. Did you because, have a learning curve? I don't think so, because I think that, I mean, that's interesting. I don't think so, because I, I, I have my general color sense that like follows me around, uh -huh. that I gravitate towards, I mean, which is basically rainbow. And, uh, and the idea is that you can, you know, I've learned a lot more. Knitting is much more um, specific about if I'm using this yarn, it's going to, except if you're using variegated, you never, you know, you get a skein that looks totally different than when you wind it up in a ball and a cake. And then it's like, once you knit with it, it does different things. Right, but right, right. In terms of the overall colors, I have a general sense of like what I like that goes together. Mm -hmm. um, I learned a lot and I'm still learning a ton about weaving has a totally different effect. So that's like, I think it's an ongoing process because I would say, you know, I'm constantly learning, oh, really? If I put this with this, it's going to do this. <laughs> and what a surprise. <laughs> um, you know, a lot of my stuff also is very graphic. So I tend to like pure colors, you know, and like... But, you know, I try, I play with everything. I think that there's, I mean, everything is a learning curve. <laughs> Breakfast this morning was a learning curve, so. <laughs> well, um, you have written several books and there's articles and you're, you're a very busy woman. You get a lot done in a day. Um, how do you think writing a book impacts on your artwork? Um, you know, they're sort of connected. Well, they're very connected actually because I spent my, um, mo the, my majority of my professional life as a graphic artist. And as a graphic artist, I worked on things like books and my husband and I had a graphic studio and did a lot of finished artwork um, out in Los Angeles. Uh, books were like a medium to me. They were really like sort of a, um, a way for me to also express what I, you know, what I, what I explore. And one of the things that I love most of all, I mean, I love nothing more than figuring something out and then telling somebody about it. <laughs> it's like, I'm, I get all excited. Look at this. So um, one of the things that the books allow me to do, um, teaching is one of my most favorite things in the world. I mean, I just love it. There's this flow of energy that you get from, you know, sharing what you love to do. And the books are an extension of that. So for me, it's part of my way of being able to show people what's in my head and my heart and just, you know, show them my creativity. And um, I was lucky enough that, you know, most of my books are self-published. I have done books with publishers. Um, I really love the art of creating a book too. Like that's part of it is that I create the book along with exploring the craft and I'm able to like, it's another extension of what I can offer. Do you ever find that you, as you're working on the book, you, I don't know, learn something new or you find you go into a different direction with your work? Yes, um, absolutely. You know, one of the things is the way that I do a book is a, is a little bit different than if you're working with a traditional publisher because I'm doing it myself. Uh -huh. The projects tend to start with some obvious stuff that I want to show, but then the book evolves with what if I try this? This will be the next project. What if I try this? This will be the next project. And like, so absolutely, like while I'm, you know, while I'm writing the book, I'm doing the projects, I'm coming up with ideas of what I want to do next. And it's all, it's like, it, it's sort of um, symbiotic. The, the, the book is happening along with the projects and the, the 
uh, I, I don't know what the book's going to be before I start. I get the idea. It's like most of my projects, I don't know what they're going to be before they start. I have an idea. I'm going to make a cardigan. I know that. What it's going to end up like and the evolution it goes through, I can't tell you what's going to happen. And But a lot of times, I mean, that that pretty much is my approach to the books is they are very much a part of the learning process. And I am evolving the technique along with what I'm writing. That's amazing. It's fun. Well, let's talk specifically about, um, you've mentioned this book a couple of times, The Crazy Shot and um, I, to me, this is an example, I would think, is where one art or craft influences another. And, and this is somebody who doesn't do a lot of the stitching kind of artwork. I'm more of a weaver. But these patterns look a lot like needlework. And it was kind of like, of course, this would work great. <laughs> but can you talk more about that? Um, so, yes, absolutely. This a whole evolution of crazy shot happened um, very serendipitously. I, uh, the beginning of COVID, we had lockdown. Um, I actually had been, I mean, I knit probably more than I should at any given time. And um, I was knitting pretty consistently. I won't even say how many hours a day, but my hands really started hurting. Mm -hmm. So I went to rheumatologists and they said, well, congratulations, you have arthritis, you have trigger finger, you have got Dupuytren's contract, you've got like all this stuff. So I thought, and they basically said, look, it would be a good idea if you just like slow it down on the knitting. So I thought, you know what, I've always loved my rigid heddle, like I've loved rigid heddle weaving and I love, you know, all kinds of small looms. I just love it. And I got my rigid heddles out and I started playing with my rigid heddle and pickup sticks because I always love the different textures you could get from pickup sticks. And then I started exploring YouTube and Kelly Casanova, who has a wonderful weaving school in Australia, um, had a video on YouTube on something called Brano weaving. And Brano weaving, I looked it up, it's nowhere. Like you can't find any information about it. And anything that I did find was on Russian websites. So I tried, you know, I, I did her technique and I thought the whole time I'm doing her technique, I'm thinking this is so much like one of my most favorite things in the world, fair isle knitting. And what, the way that it was approached, the way that um, Kelly approached it was each warp is like a stitch on your knitting needle. So every warp across is like one stitch and you're, you're dealing with one at a time. So when you're knitting and you're knitting Fair Isle, uh -huh. you're, you're basically you have two colors. One stitch is either one color or the other color. And then you go to the next one, one color or the other color, one color or the other. And depending on what the chart says, this, this is all very chart based, depending on what the chart says is whether you knit with this color or this color. Um, and I started thinking, you know, those charts are really important. And I wonder if I could take the Fair Isle charts and approach this Brano weaving type of thing the same way in that each warp is a stitch and you either go over it or under it and you go over it and this is where crazy shot comes in because this is very loosely related to overshot weaving mm -hmm. uh, in that in overshot weaving you're creating a background fabric and then you're creating a pattern that floats on the surface of the background fabric and the thing that made the most sense to me is if i have to make something one color or the other color i'm either going over it with a float or under it and the warp will show. And it was like, oh, okay, so what happens if every time I need the new color, I go, I take my pickup stick and I go over. And every time I want it to be the other color, I go under and I just would like follow my charts and weave my pickup stick through following whatever chart it was. And it worked, it worked great with so many charts. So then I started thinking, oh my gosh, what about my cross stitch? What about my embroidery? What about, I mean, like there's so many things that use charts and I am a huge fan. I mean, in crochet, you name it. 
I love charts. I love these simple charted designs. And that's probably from my graphic design background. Like the patterns are, you know, I love making mm -hmm. patterns. I love just like repeating patterns and making patterns. So when I figured out that, you know, I could do this with the rigid heddle, it was like, okay, all bets are off. I'm now exploring this for, I don't know, the rest of my life. So. That, that's amazing. Um, after I, after I started looking at your book, it was like, oh yeah, I mean, and it, you're right. It kind of opens up all these doors of what could else, you know, what else can I do? So, and the thing that, you know, the thing that I find really amazing is I started out with the fair isle stuff. Then I went back to other needlework, much more complex patterns, stuff that you really aren't going to do. This is the bottom. This actually mirrors. But I mean, to do this on a floor loom, you know, mm -hmm. it's like that's why it's not exactly overshot because overshot is has to do with the threading through how many shuttles you have. Um, the, the thing about this is it's more akin to backstrap weaving or something where you're dealing with each warp at a time and I'm either going over or under whatever I'm doing. I am doing it according to the chart, but I can do any number of designs. One of the things that I love so much about this approach is you are not stuck to one threading. You can do whatever you want at any time. You can like change your patterns. You can introduce a new pattern. You can play with the patterns. Um, the other thing that I love about this is it's really easy to change color. So just like fair isle knitting, where you can, you know, you're basically using two colors at once, but every row could be two different colors, whatever you want to do. You're doing the same thing with Crazy Shot, where you are in, in introducing the warp is always going to be the same color, but the weft is going to be whatever colors you want. So sometimes it ends up looking very much like a fair isle design. Sometimes I do overall design. Sometimes I do lots of you know, different designs, it's there, it's endless. It's like really endless, which I'm still exploring. Dora the Explorer. Dora the Explorer. Um, you've also, you're also, I'm gonna shift gears here. You're also a professional artist. I mean, you, you follow that um, as your career. Do you ever find there's a struggle between the business person and the artist or the, yeah, the creativity and the selling? You know, I don't think so because to be quite honest, I have the luxury of time to explore what I wanna do apart from what I do professionally. So a lot of times what I'm investigating and what I'm, you know, being creative with, that's aside from what I'm doing professionally. And, and then, after I start the exploring, then that becomes the next thing I do professionally. So it's sort of like, I don't feel really hindered by it or, you know, and also I guess the other thing is that I'm kind of known for jumping around. Like I try all different stuff. So I don't feel pigeonholed into, I always have to do crochet or I always have to do whatever, because it's like, I think the thing that people know about me most is, what was that? What's over there? <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, it's like, I think that it's kind of par for the course that, you know, I'm going to, I think it's kind of expected. It's like something else is coming up down the line. And creatively, I like to have that as sort of a separate thing from what I'm, you know, what I'm working on. And then they sort of morph together for a while until, you know, and it's a funny thing because I think that a lot of times after I've fully explored what I want to do with it and then taught it quite a lot, I'm ready to move on for in both ways. It's like, I'm not going to keep teaching the same stuff. Sometimes it comes back in a new way, but I generally am changing my entire roster of classes like every couple of years to include whatever I've just been obsessed with. It was so funny. I was at a, a, yard sa a yarn sale this weekend and I had mentioned to you earlier, I met this new student and we were talking and I was telling her about your book and I told her your name and she goes, doesn't she do knitting? I know <laughs> that name from knitting. I was like, oh, she does everything. She does yeah, everything. Yeah, like you'll see me all over the place. Uh, I, I tend to like, you know, I'll hop in anywhere. Well, you are all over the internet also. And I think it's fascinating that, I don't know if you were, thinking it at the time, but you were way ahead of the curve because 
if nothing else with COVID, everybody had to start learning how to do online teaching. But you started this with Craftsy and all these other online teaching organizations a long time ago. So how did you get started way back when, before COVID hit and everybody was doing online? You know, in some ways, I am so blessed. The stars have just really aligned for me in terms of my fiber career. And that was part of it was, you know, I had been um, doing my graphic design and around 2008, the world changed and at least the United States economy changed and we weren't doing as much graphic design work. And so I found myself doing way more of my own stuff while I was stressing about what I was going to be for when I grew up. So I um, I was doing a lot of work and the, my local yarn store kept saying to me, you should come teach classes. You should just come teach classes. And I thought, okay, you know, I'll go teach classes. And so I had been teaching for them. And then I used to go to Stitches, which is knittinguniversity.com. I used to go to Stitches events. I lived in Los Angeles and I would go up to San Francisco and Oakland and, and um, I loved it. So I just kind of said to them, hey, I teach and I'd be interested. And they were like, great. And um, I really have to credit, especially Benjamin Levisay, who is, he has created more opportunity in, in my fiber life than anybody else. Um, he is the CEO of XRX Inc., that does, they used to do um, knitting ma Knitters Magazine, they do lots of publications, but at the, at, currently they're doing online stitching, um, stitches events. But back then we were doing live events. I would go travel the country and, and teach in person. And he got a call from the people that started Craftsy and wondering about, did he know anyone that would be interested in doing this new form of education. And he came and asked a bunch of, uh, of his teachers and we were like the first, you know, some of the first craftsy instructors. To, and uh, we were like, you know, filming them out of people's living rooms. And, um, and it, was, it was an amazing experience. And I learned so much from doing those classes. And then over the years, I ended up teaching five different craftsy classes on all different stuff, lots of different kinds of stuff. So, um, but yeah, no, good old Benjamin Levisay. I have to give him his props. <laughs> That's, yeah, it's amazing. If you go online, if, if you Google your name, it takes forever to yeah. get through everything because you've done so much teaching and you're very generous with it too. There's a lot like on your website that you just give away for free. You don't even ask people to pay for it. So, well, you know, I sort of feel like it, you know, this thing of there's nothing that I know that other people don't know. Honest to God, there's just not. I didn't invent anything, I didn't come up with anything. Basically, I'm just showing you how I do it. And I'm showing you, it's kind of like I sort of think of creativity this way. I think it's really important. Um, I think everyone's creative. I think absolutely everyone's creative. And I think that people doubt their creativity, but you know, to me, creativity is you're, it, you are showing people through whatever it is, you're cooking, you're baking, you're sewing, you're weaving, whatever, how you see the world, how you brought everything in, you filter it and you spit it back out this way. Like this is your, the way you, your vocabulary and the way you see it. And I always sort of feel like, you know, everything that I do really comes back to, this is my filter. I'm not, I'm not inventing anything. I mean, the as crazy shot goes back to like King Tut era. Like there's, and people who have been doing that kind of weaving a very long time. So it's not like I come up with any of these process. It's that I've like, taken a lot of stuff in and now this is the way I see it and I and I love showing people oh you could do it this way or you could do it that way in terms of the the stuff that I give away for free I mean I think technique is technique and I I'm happy to show anybody how to do anything so you know I mean the creative aspect of the stuff is way more interesting to me about how people express themselves through fiber and what they do with it and especially culturally you know I mean there's so mm. many and that's why I I was so touched when Weave a Real Peace sponsored me because they are exactly what is in my heart of, there are people all over the world throughout all of time 
that have used fiber to express themselves. And these cultures do remarkable stuff that very few people know about. It's like, it's not seen, it's really not seen. And you know, when I was doing, there's something called modern Irish crochet, um, which comes out of Russia. Very few people in the United States know about it. And it is the most glorious stuff you've ever seen. So, you know, it's just for me, it's really a matter of you got to see this. And then as far as the technique goes, those are just tools and you can learn them any number of ways. I'm happy to like show somebody how to do whatever they want to learn how to do. You're a good person. Well, you went to the Pennsylvania Academy of Fine Arts um, and you were an, uh, a painter, correct? originally yeah originally and then yeah, you did some other things yeah but because I and I'm I might get shot for this but to me I always think of it, it's a very prestigious institution and I also think of it as somewhat conservative it's kind of down the middle there of you know fine arts kind of thing so how did you go from this <clears throat> excuse me this type of training <laughs> to where you are now with mostly crafts Okay, that is so cool. Um, so yeah, when I went to the academy, um, I didn't fit in real well because it was the 70s and <coughs> I was really interested in abstract expressionism, which is, you know, sort of uh, an offshoot of impressionism. You were doing a lot of painting by feeling and all that. And there weren't a whole lot of people at the academy who were really supportive. Like they, they're very classical painters. There were a few teachers who, you know, were, I was able to, um, communicate with, but the type of work that I did really was more, I don't know, it was more, and I found out later on, there was a movement of art in the 70s that I didn't realize at the time, headed by a guy named Robert Kaufman called the um, pattern and design movement. I was much more interested in, and he he's sort of an offshoot of like Art Nouveau and like, you know, the, um, the Macintosh stuff and just beautiful stuff. I was always more drawn to the color and the texture and what the paint could do and all of that than I was the subject matter. You know, it was like, I just liked, you know, and I, I in the seventies, they came out with pearlescent paints and I was like, and glitter and you name it. And so, you know, that didn't float real well with the Academy. Um, so, and then I tried being a painter for a few years and that didn't work because I ended up waitressing. And so I went back to school. There was a little school in Philadelphia called Studio School of Art and Design. And I learned commercial art and commercial art was much more graphically oriented. Um, and I really took to it. Like I really liked it, but I should say I was a closet crocheter, sewer, knitter that whole time. Like you didn't talk about it. You know what you know, like the 70s was kind of cool, but by the 80s, like we weren't talking about, you didn't talk about that knitter. That's crazy. I had always been doing it and I really loved it. I really, really loved it. And uh, it was really as a downturn of our one industry, the graphic industry, I decided, you know what? I really want to start exploring professionally what I can do with the stuff I love even more than anything. You know, it's like I, I loved all the fabrics and all the yarns and all that stuff. And it actually never occurred to me to use them in my art. And then I have to tell you, one of the first influences I had is a woman named Prudence Mapstone. Prudence Mapstone has a website called Not Just Knitting, K-N-O-T. And she was involved in the early 2000s in something called the um, freeform crochet movement. And freeform oh. crochet is, I mean, it's, it now is a huge, huge um, uh, art form. But I, and, and back then I got on Prodigy and found her. And I couldn't believe that she was like making art out of crochet. Like it blew <laughs> my mind. I just thought, you got to be kidding me. I can use the stuff that I do professionally and like explore my creative side and use yarn. And it like, so I, I was lucky enough. I, uh, I lived in Los Angeles. 
uh, in Santa Monica, there was a store called Wild Fiber, and she came from Australia and taught a like three day workshop that I didn't sleep for about two months afterward. And it changed everything. I mean, it really changed everything because it was the metamorphosis of everything that I've been doing secretly and publicly, <laughs> and I could combine them, and it was really fun. And what was her name again? Her name is Prudence Mapstone, M-A-P-S-T-O-N-E. Okay. And she is still, I mean, she does beautiful um, freeform crochet. Her work is magnificent. It's probably the best there is. Um, and she runs tours. She teaches and she runs tours, but she only is in Australia. She used to come to the United States, but she hasn't in many, many years. But just going to her website, you'll see that, you know, there are certain people that over the years, I discovered what they're doing in fiber and they just blow my mind. I mean, it's yeah. like, I cannot believe one of my other favorite people in the world is this woman, Asha Verten, A-S-I-A. V-E-R-T-E-N. She was um, from Russia. She is a couture crochet um, uh, wardrobe artist out of Italy. So she does a lot of runway stuff out of Italy, but her crochet is an art form. I mean, it's just art. It's so beautiful. So, and I love, I mean, there's a lot of stuff that's happened over the years um, with gorilla knitting, gorilla crochet with, so there's a lot, what I love is there's a lot more, you know, we spent many, many years doing women's work and it wasn't, you know, craft wasn't really art and all that. I think that's all complete nonsense. I think however you want to express yourself with whatever medium, it's all art to me and it's all beautiful. And, you know, and I am just thrilled that I get to like express myself and play with sticks and string. Sticks and strings. I like that. <laughs> well, what's next for you? What's, what's around the bin for you? That is a really good question. Um, I am still deep down the rabbit hole with crazy shot. I really love it. But one of the things that uh, knocked my socks off was last summer, I was watching a woman from Guatemala, Florinda Lopez. Um, she is, I forget the name of the, it begins with an O. She's part of a collective that displays at a museum in Guatemala city. Um, what she was doing with backstrap weaving was really akin to a lot of the stuff that I'm exploring right now. Mm -hmm. So my hope, dreams, focus is learning Spanish as much as I can from my ninth grade Spanish and getting myself to Guatemala and taking lessons from the Mayan women. You know, I, I would really like to just, you know, explore the, the interesting thing about it. And this is a little nerdy, but what I do now is something called um, continuous supplementary weft weaving. And so supplementary weft, meaning that I'm doing my fabric like overshot, but my other yarn that I'm using is the pattern yarn. I take it the entire way across. So in any given row, I am using the same yarn across the row. One of the things that I find fascinating and beautiful and just a whole world to explore is uh, the work that's done by the Guatemalan weavers is called discontinuous supplemental weft. Oh. Where what they're doing is they're only taking the colors partially across. So it's more akin to intarsion knitting or tapestry weaving. They're doing it in the same weaving structure. It's still sort of this overshot fabric where you're creating this background fabric and you're creating a pattern over. And, and one of the things I should say that I love most about this fabric that you make is it's reversible. So you're, <laughs> you're either going under or over your warps. So what you get on the back of it is the negative. Um, I know that with backstrap, there's a lot of changing of colors in the background, but I'm really, really curious about like, how can I do discontinuous in what I'm doing now? So that's, the, that, that's kind of where my brain is headed next. Well, let's take some questions. And we've had a couple people ask about your vest. Oh, this is one of my favorite clothing companies. Johnny was, 
And uh, Johnny Woods is a, um, a company, I think, out of New York. And even better, Johnny Woods was named after the Bob Marley song, Johnny Was a Good Man. And um, their style is really bohemian. So you'll often see me in, like a lot of times I wear the stuff I make, but it's hot here now. So I'm not wearing as much um, yarn oriented, you know, products, um, but I love Johnny Woods. And it's W A S like was. Yeah, it's J O H N N Y. Johnny was and like their their websites to drool over. I just love their clothing. So well, there you go, everybody. They Check fit all out. embroidered, all hand, you know, hand embroidered, beautiful stuff. All right, we've got um, Deborah Chandler. Hello, Deborah. Deborah Chandler, yay! Hello. <laughs> He says, my students nearly always choose their first yarns and sync with what they're wearing and never realizing it. It was fun. Maybe we wake up feeling blue or green or purple that day. Thank you, Deborah. That's great. Uh, thank you. Hold on. Come here, buddy. Okay, sorry about that. <laughs> um, yeah, no, it's amazing. It's like once you start noticing, you, you go... Like if I know that I want to pick some colors, a lot of times I'll take a piece of fabric with me, but if I'm wearing something that doesn't mix, it's like, I'm probably not going to be as satisfied with my shopping. So. Right. Um, Marsha, oh, we, we did that. Somebody, everybody was asking about um, Verton, Asia Verton. Oh, Asia Verton. Yeah, so we've posted her name in the yeah. chat. For yeah. all of you. Um, she, her, she has a couple books, but they're all in um, Russian language, but everything is charted. So if you are a crochet, also, I just happen to have a class on Craftsy on <laughs> Shameless Club. I just happen to have a class, a class on Craftsy on um, Modern Irish Crochet, where I teach you how to read the charts. You don't have to read Russian. The, how I got into that was really interesting was in the early 2000s, there was a magazine that came out of Ukraine called Duplet Magazine. And I saw it on Etsy and I ordered a few of them and realized there's charts. Like I know how to read charts. I can do this. And their charts are very, I mean, they're not universal in that they don't use exactly the same symbols as English language um, crochet charts, but easy to learn them, easy to read them. And their work is magnificent. I mean, they're, they're doing an art form and the whole history of that is a whole other thing, but their, their art form is a true new art form in fiber art that came out like in 2000. Wow. All yeah. right. I've checked based, that on out. based on traditional Irish crochet, which was all done in white, what Ukraine and uh, what Ukraine brought to it was multicolor. They're, they're, you know, they tend towards lots of multicolor in their traditional clothing. Th they brought that to Irish crochet. So it's astounding. <laughs> uh, Michelle Gons Gennis. Michelle, sorry, I'm a butcher in your name. What are your inspirations to create? Oh, good question, Michelle. Nature, fantasy, the purpose. Since you jump around using different mediums, what tickles your fancy? What triggers your need to create the next thing? Wild fiber was the only place to learn weaving back in the day. Right. By the way, jacarana is a Spanish word and should be pronounced, oh. Jacaranda. Jacaranda. Michelle, you're, you're cruel. I can't pronounce things. <laughs> In, in, in LA, we call them jacaranda trees. So he says, pronounce the J's and H. Oh, jacaranda. Okay, I never heard that, but all right. We all know what you're referring to, though. Yeah. Um. Yeah. What does what does inspire you? Where do you get your inspiration? Um. Boy, this is going to sound repetitive, but it's color. It's color. It's like, I'm just inspired by color all the time. And there are colors that, you know, like I gravitate towards and then I just want to see, like, I want to get all of the turquoises I can. And then I get all of the plums and, you know, like whatever it is, I want to like get all the different shades. And um, 
there, I think that it's more about color and texture. The textures of the yarns really speak to me a lot. And a lot of times my inspiration just comes from, I hold the yarn in my hands and I'm like, mm, this is so nice. I just want to make something out of it. Um, a lot of times too, sometimes I'm shopping or I might be like at a craft fair or something. And I see something and I immediately think I can make that. And so, you know, like I get inspired by some piece of clothing I see, but I'm not making the piece of clothing. I just love what it was saying. And I want to like, I want to make something because it got me excited to make something. So. Do you, do you collect images? Do you have like a, a book or do you take pictures a lot of things you see or I does it just really. stay in your mind? Yeah, no, I don't really. I mean, I think that um, for me, it's really kind of the amalgamation of everything I've ever seen. And like, it's just sort of all in there somewhere and it pops up at odd moments. So no, I don't really collect pictures. I mean, I have collected them, but I don't really go back and look at them. <laughs> I've collected lots of pictures that I don't look at, so. <laughs> um. Karen LeBlanc wants to know, have you combined weaving, crochet, coiling, and other forms of fiber art? I'm assuming she's asking, have you done that like in one piece? Do you ever I, do that? I was really exploring weaving, knitting, and crochet in the same piece. I have some sweaters that I did that are template-based. One of the books that I did was called Knit in New Directions, and it talks all about template-based work. It's my approach to how I create a, a garment. Um, I've done sweaters where I wove the fabric first and then used, cut up the fabric into different pieces and shapes and different things, and then picked up and knitted or crocheted off of them in different directions to fill out and make the fabric. Really? Um, yeah, absolutely. I love Oh, it. I'd love to see that. Yeah, 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 yeah. So one of the, you know, like I love combining them and, and you know, I mean, different things work differently. One of the things that I love is I love weaving in the structure of a garment, but I love knitting in the sleeves because it's so soft and pliable and, and mm. drapey. So, you know, a lot of times I'll do and finishing techniques. I mean, you can do gorgeous finishing techniques on weaving with crochet and with, you know, knitting, picking up off the edges. Um, so yeah, I've done a lot of stuff. I do a lot of uh, okay, I will spill the beans about this a little bit. The next book that I'm actually currently working on <laughs> is a book on wearables and crazy shot wearables, but it's also template based. It's completely template based where you're going to create the fabrics based on you know whatever it is and then you have the you can if you want change the patterning, do whatever you want with it. But there's, um, you know, I, I kind of look at all of my stuff as what I would call structured freeform and structured freeform, meaning I love to start with a structure of something. I want to know what, how to create the structure. If it's a muslin, if I'm knitting and I'm going to create a shawl shape or if I'm, you know, a crochet, a lot of times I do crochet, uh, creative crochet shawls. And I just need to know what is the rate of increase? I need to know like, what is the structure to make the thing? Then I can introduce all kinds of color and texture and pattern and all kinds of stuff within that structure. Uh, so, you know, my, my process a lot of times is getting all my colors together, figuring out what the structure is that I want to make, and then just diving in and playing and see what, I'm, what I can come up with. There you go. Uh, Nancy Nagel wants to know if you explored clasp weft and multi-ball clasp weft. Hello, Nancy Nagel. Um, <laughs> uh, I've done a lot. Of, I have done a little bit of the clasp warp, but I've done a lot of clasp weft and yeah, love it. Just, it's wonderful. It's, there's so much to explore and with rigid heddle, especially there's just like it, you know, it's not. I know that a lot of times it seems limited in terms of like, well, you're making this fabric. And what's really cool is a lot of people now are getting into multi-shaft on rigid heddle looms, which is really amazing. Um, I don't, I have tried it many times. I don't tend towards doing it for a couple of reasons. One is the pattern is more fixed than I like. Um, your threading has to do with what patterns you can, you know, and, and a lot of them, there's lots of different options in pattern, but I like to have a little more freedom. The other is it hurts my hands. 
Like if I am doing the multi shaft and I am really like pressing down. So the one nicest thing about rigid pedal that I love so much is um, this is pretty much it. You know, it's like it's got one headle. I mean, it's either in neutral, up or down, and the stick. And so it's very hand friendly. You know, I think that rigid pedal is a lovely hand friendly. Um, type of, uh, of craft that you can do for extended, because I am fairly obsessed about things and tend to work more than I should, um, I can do it for more extended periods of time than I can a lot of the other stuff that I, I have played with in the past. Well, I, I didn't read the rest of Nancy's question. I'm sorry, Nancy. She said, um, in the crazy shot yet for the intra intarsia-esque effects. What about it? Does she, she want to know, to know about if it? you use the clasp weave in the oh, crazy shot to get, get the interstarian-esque yeah. <laughs> No, but now that you mention it, <laughs> that's very interesting. I like you go, Nancy. You got her off on another tangent. Yeah, she gets me going all the time. So yeah, great idea. Well, I can't believe it, but we have to stop. Okay. This was so much fun. Thank it you so was. much. Thank you yeah. so much. Yeah. You, you really have a different point of view and I love that. That's wonderful. That's cool. Thank you for sharing that with us today and, and letting us come into your gorgeous studio. That Thank was wonderful. You. Thank you. I appreciate it. And uh, thanks everybody for joining me. <laughs> <laughs> if you want to see more and trust me, there is a lot more. Go to Mara's website. My, Mara's website is marawood.com. She has everything on there. There's all kinds of videos, how to's. She is so, so generous with her work. And uh, so check that out. Um, we want to say thank you to Warp weave a real piece and it was in the chat also but if you didn't see it their uh, meeting is at the end of the month and it's on zoom it's free to everyone if you're curious about warp you want to learn more about it check it out um, and just um, go to their website google weave a real piece you'll get there and find out more about their uh, meeting at the end of the month they will also be a convergence you'll see warp people there and uh, we do appreciate you all, not only just for sponsoring Textiles and Tea today, but all the great work that you do. Um, so go check them out. We uh, also want to encourage you all, if you like the programming that you see here, if you would like to see more programming, please join or um, donate to the Fiber Trust. A lot of the programming that we do, like um, Textiles and Tea, the careers in textiles, spinning and weaving week, all those things are through donations and the Fiber Trust. And if you enjoy these programs, please join, um, donate at weavespindie.org. If you missed any of the episodes, you can watch them on Facebook or you can watch them on YouTube. Um, we are putting those up as we go. And if you if you sign up, if you subscribe to the HGA YouTube page, you will get a notice when a new YouTube episode has been uploaded. It takes us a little while, so we're a few episodes back, but uh, if you want to see some of the ones that you've missed, you have a couple of options there. We have Convergence coming up. Can you believe it? Four years in the making. It is next month. I can't believe I'm saying that. So if you're still looking at what you want to do at Convergence, we're still classes open. And also there's other things going on. Even if you don't want to take any more classes, we have the skein competition. That's new this year. Um, for all you spinners out there, you want to submit some of your work, show it off. We would love to have your uh, work there. And it's going to be in the vendor hall for everyone to see. So again, go to the website, go to the Convergence um, note little page and uh, in there, there'll be all the information about how you can enter the skein competition. We have uh, tons of volunteer opportunities. If you've got a few minutes that you want to um, kind of support HGA in another way, this is a good way to do it. We need people to do something as simple as sit at the door. We need people to keep an eye on the exhibits. I mean, would you want to sit and exhibit for an hour or two? Oh, please don't make me do that. We have all kinds of things available that you can do. 
Don't forget we got the shuttle race this year. You gotta make those shuttles. You can either do it just for its good looks or you can do it for speed. That too is on our website. You can find out more about that. And also sheep to shaw. We're looking for sheep to shaw teams. Get your friends together, those spinners and uh, weavers and let's get a team together. Don't just attend Convergence, be a part of it. We would love to have you there. Um, next week, we have Adrian Gaskell as our guest and we appreciate her doing that. Just a heads up, we're gonna have a program change this month. So keep an eye on that. We had someone who had to cancel and they will be, um, we're gonna have somebody else take her time slot. So keep an eye on the website and I'll be sending out notices to let you know about that change. But next week, Adrian Gaskell, Kumi Hemo Queen. She's very good at it and you'll love it. Hope you'll have a great week and thank you so much for joining us today. Happy tea.